Uh, and as said, we are going to speak about um, six. I really didn't count that. It might be seven, it might be five. So, so you can count and, and, and see if we reach six. I believe we reach more. Uh, different ways for implementing um, what we'll see, uh, math expression calculator. Uh, so uh, before we begin, uh, I have to start uh, shortly with a bio and uh, a few marketing slides. Uh, so I think I would, was introduced, I, I'm a visiting lecturer at Stony Brook University uh, in New York this year, which means that I'm coming from Long Island. Um, and uh, since Incredible is sponsoring, I think not only this event, but uh, also maybe a few events later on this year, so we decided that uh, it should be with a lecture by Incredibuild. So, so here I am. Um, I'm a developer advocate at Incredibuild, and, and maybe I have to uh, tell you what Incredibuild does. We do build acceleration. So if you are suffering from slow builds, which is something that many C++ developers suffer from, uh, it might be your build, it might be your entire CI pipeline, like testing, static code analysis. Uh, we accelerate builds. Um, and we do it by distribution the build into idle machines or to the cloud and caching. Now, um, in some cases I'm being uh, approached with, oh, but uh, we know about other open source possibilities, which there are. And I, I just want to tell you that we have um, quite a big R&D team and support, which actually makes things smoothest. Uh, and it is important that if your build um, doesn't work for some reason, it's not because of the tool. So um, if you want to discuss with me, I mean, if you're using any other tool which works for you, I'm happy with, for that. If your build is slow and you're not using any tool, um, there, is, there is a reason many companies are using us. Here is a short list. Um, I will not go through all the list, but... Uh, many big companies like Adobe and, and others in this list. Um, and, and the reason eventually is that we all know that time is money. Uh, I mean, if we can accelerate the build and then see if we have any issues during the testing or everything goes smoothly and we can go to our next feature, it is important. Uh, we invested a lot in the recent year in automotive, which uh, includes uh, Linux, by the way, we are both Windows and Linux and uh, also um, work recently on Mac. Uh, so in the past, we were only Windows. Uh, when I say in the past, maybe 10 years ago, uh, and many people know about us about, oh, you do uh, Windows acceleration. We do also Linux and uh, also embedded Linux recently. Uh, so all this uh, is about incredible, and feel free to talk with, with me about that later. You'll also have my email if you want to reach me on that. Okay, so this is the initial challenge. Um, this is something that I'm using in order to teach polymorphism. Uh, we want to create some kind of an expression, a mathematical expression, and we want to evaluate it. And this is the main. The main would look something like uh, we have a new sum of two elements. Can you see the elements that we are trying to sum? One of them is an exponent of three and two, and the other one is minus one. And not surprising, uh, we expect the result to be eight. But we also want to print it, so when, when we uh, see out that uh, uh, d ref of e, we want to see the three to the power of two plus minus one, and then we, when we call eval, we want to see the eight, okay? So there are two parts of the printout. One is, is, is printing the expression, and the other one is evaluating the expression. Uh, th this is, I mean, quite a, a basic exercise that, that we can do together. Let's start. So let's start from the basic. Uh, I'll open my Collier U, and I will try to uh, code with one end because I have to hold the mic with the other one. Uh, and let's see if Polio is not blocked here. Maybe it is blocked by the Wi-Fi. Okay. No, I thought that it came. Okay, yeah, I see something. Okay, so uh, if you remember, we saw that expression is something that you can evaluate and that, that you can print, 
okay? So I, I want to think with you about what is expression, okay? You see expression here? Can you help me implement expression? What, what we should we have in expression? It's a struct, so no need for the public. I need something for the C out, okay? So something like uh, we return uh, uh, probably a friend, okay? I assume, right? That returns O stream. Uh, I can, you know, try to type with one hand. Uh, o stream, I think that, yeah, I, I, I'm adding using O stream. Uh, operator, operator with O, uh, extractor, okay? Uh, that will take O stream, right? Now, now, then the question is, uh, how can we actually print in, in this operator? I mean, expression is going to be an abstract class, right? Probably expression is going to be an abstract class. Do you agree with that? So the question is, what should we do here when we try to print expression? What do you say? We need to, to do something with the expression, but I, I, I mean, I, I cannot... Uh, th this function cannot be virtual because it's a friend function, it's a global function, but we cannot actually implement that because we don't know how to uh, print expression. So probably what we want to do is to help a function like e dot print into out, for example. Okay. And for that, probably we need a virtual a virtual void print. Oh, I forgot to return. Let's say that we return out. We could have decided that print returns something and then we could return print itself. Anyhow, that's fine. And then we can take O stream out. Let's practice copy paste. Okay, and what next? Ons probably. And then equals zero. Okay, yeah, we don't know how to implement that. I mean, it's not our job. Okay, what else? One more. Uh, so we need to evaluate. If you remember, there was an evaluate, okay? And the function was called eval. So if I will copy that, just because I'm lazy, uh, and then I will say, okay, it's not print, it's eval, and it doesn't take any arguments, and it can be const, but it should return value, which should be double, I guess. Okay, so, so I, I think that now we are done with, with expression, and then the question is, what about the rest? Do you remember what other classes we had there? I, I remember some. And the sum that I remember are sum, and, and exp, and number, right? Uh, what are the relations between them, between them and expression? They're all expressions, including number. Yeah, number is an expression, right? So uh, since we want to do other things today, I already implemented them here below. So we'll not implement all of them, but uh, number is an expression, okay? Uh, we should implement print and we should implement eval. Number is quite easy. I mean, being a number, evaluating a number is, is the, the easy part of this drill. Uh, then I think that it would be Contributing to have a binary expression because some and, and X share some functionality, both do something quite similar. So let's use templates for the operation because we want to print the operation and you know printing might be implemented once. Uh, and then we need to think about, well, if you remember in the main, I can show you the main here. In the main, we have a lot of, a lot of allocations, but eventually we have only one delete. Okay, but uh, it should work without any leak because the one that owns all the allocations is the root expression, which is sum. Who holds the expression, the exponent and the numbers, etc. So what I want in binary expression is that it will hold all the pointers and in the destructor it will uh, lead them. Oh, I forgot something quite important which will not make things compile. What did I forget? The virtual destructor, nobody helped me here. So uh, expression, I need something like tilde x 
refresh and write. Without that, it will not compile because I said, what did I say down below? I think override. Okay. I think that now we are fine. We, we can actually check that. So we, we added the expression class and yeah, we, we get the proper, um, the proper output with, with sum. You, you can see that sum is quite simple. We are um, getting the, the constructor from the base. No need to re-implement the constructor by using constructor inheritance from C++11. Uh, this is the base class. And we are doing the same thing here for exp. And we're inheriting from binary expression with a proper template argument. And we only have to implement an eval IMPL because eval, we actually implemented the eval in binary expression. Evaluating is calling eval IMPL with two doubles. Because we know that in order to evaluate an expression, a binary expression, you have to first evaluate both sides, the left hand and right hand, and then do something with the two sides. So we, we first call evaluate on the, on the two sides and then call another new virtual function which will be implemented by the derived classes. Quite easy. Okay, nice, I like that. So we got it. And then the question is, what is bothering you with the code below? I mean, it's nice, it works. I don't like it so much. Okay, so first, do we have any reason for heap allocation? Maybe because we have uh, polymorphism, I don't know. That's a question that we will discuss today. Uh, but before asking whether we actually need any allocation, we have here one, two, three, four, five new and one delete, which is bothering me in a way. I mean, I would want it to be symmetric. And, and, and which number, which symmetric number is the nicer one? Zero. Yeah. Uh, uh, and for having zero allocations, and, and I guess that the next phase would be smart pointers. So, so let's think if we can have some smart pointers for that. And let's start from here. I mean, let's do it together. This is the same thing, I think, that, oh, why, why should I open? Oh, it's the same thing. We just created that one. Okay. So you should help me here because I want to change the main. I mean, first thing would be to add some includes, right? So smart pointers, which one should we take? Memory and which uh, smart pointer? I think unique PTR should be nice. Stood unique, unique PTR. And maybe we can also take STD make unique. So we'll not have to say STD for that if we want. Okay. So once we have all that, we can use unique PTR. And then the question is where? Let's start with the main. I mean, in the main, I warn you, it's going to be maybe as ugly as it was before, maybe more, maybe less, but something like make unique, right? Make unique of this beauty, right? And then with the help of copy paste, we can do the make unique for all the rest. Also exp, you also have to be a make unique and also number. But then the question is, who will handle all these make uniques? Right? So let's go for all of them. Not so nice. But I think that we handle that almost. Okay, we can compile, right? Yes, we can. It will not compile, but we can. Uh, so then the question is, okay, what next? So the, the thing is that, um, I mean, the main is fine. After you have a make unique, you, you can deref it, you can call eval. The problem is that the constructor here, the constructor of binary expression somewhere here. Where's binary expression? We don't have binary expression here for some reason. Oh, we do have. So the constructor of binary expression, where it is? Binary expression. Uh, exp expects two, two pointers to expression. Okay, should we change something here? Sure. So first thing that we should change is have a unique PTR here, right? We need a unique PTR here because we are going to hold two unique PTRs and then without the stars. And then we can say, okay, you know what? I will just get the unique PTRs from you. So you will be nice enough to provide unique PTRs of expression. Okay, this is one, this is two. And then the question is, is it okay what we're doing here? 
almost. We need to to move them, right? Stood, move. Okay. Is it okay uh, the way that we get them here? Um, our values. I think that in a way we expect our values because we we wouldn't be able to copy them if they are not our values. So I can say, okay, I am expecting our values. And uh, and we are actually moving moving them. So yeah, um, it couldn't be anything else. Uh, this is the second move. And then the question is, what about the distractor? How should we change the distractor? That's the movies. Okay. And rule of zero, which is good. We are happy. Uh, do we still need a virtual distractor in the base? Sure, we need uh, because. There is some kind of a default distractor in the derived and we want to reach the proper distractor, otherwise a mess. We must have a virtual distractor. So let's see if we did all right, if we have it. Uh, I've got some delete somewhere. Oh, no need to delete because there isn't any other manual allocation. It will be all deleted in the end. Yeah, and, and I have address sanitizer. I mean, if, if something is not deleted, probably the address sanitizer would say there is a leak. Okay, we did something. I'm quite happy. Are you happy? Yeah, why not? Uh, what is bothering you with, the, with this code? It's messy. It's ugly. Um, it, it, it repeats something again and again, right? Um, it uses some kind of internal decision, internal de design decision in the color code in the user code. I mean, the fact that I want to use unique PTRs, or I think that unique PTRs are good here, is in a way a design decision that I don't want to expose to the user. So uh, what is your first thought here? Design pattern of some kind? Factory, yeah. I, I mean, I want to create something without saying, I want a unique PTR. So uh, I want to hide that. I want to, to do something like, it, it might be a factory method. It might be a constructor. You know what? It might be the constructor. It might be that I create a sum and then send to it an X, a number, et cetera. And then the question is, wait. You are creating a lot of objects, which are all in this syntax are temporaries. So a lot of temporaries are going to be born and then at the end of the statement, die, which won't be too costly. I mean, it's not so bad because I will just move them. Eventually, they are all going to be born, moved into a proper holder. And then eventually, there would be one called E that will all this sum. OK? Probably, by the way, this sum will not be moved. It will be just created on E itself as uh, RVO. Uh, so uh, there will be optimization on that one, maybe on the others as well. So we want to reach the, this. Okay, how can we reach this? And, and I think that we can agree that this seems much better than the mess that we had before. So um, maybe, maybe we'll skip the, I, I mean, the live coding here be, would be nice, but I want to reach a few others. So let's go directly to how, do, do you have in mind how to do that? The constructor, the constructor should change now, right? Before that, the constructor expected a unique PTR. What the constructor should expect now? An expression. An expression. Maybe an R value. Maybe an R value, right? OK. Uh, but in a way, we are going in a way towards value semantics. I mean, instead of saying, give me pointers, give me references, I want to work with smart pointers. I want to work with objects. It might be that I cannot copy the objects. Might be, but I can still get them. So, so in a way, we want to go to a constructor that, did I open the, that one? No, not yet. Uh, we want a constructor that will take the objects as actual objects. So expression stays the same. Then number, in a way, stays the same. And then if you go to binary expression, inside it will still hold unique PTR. Because this is the way that I hold something for polymorphism, OK? But when you provide me the expressions that I want to hold, I will just take two expressions, E1 and E2, as our values. 
And then I will do the make unique inside. But then the question is, when you do a make unique, you need to say which kind of expression you are using. So I need a template. Why do I need a template? Because when I get the expression from the user, I, I need to catch the type of the expression in order to make a unique type, unless maybe I will implement a clone function, okay, or something like that. Um, but here, I'm having a template constructor, templated constructor, which gets expression one and expression two as a template argument. Um, and then I can actually forward expression one, which here the forward would be always move. I mean, if you try to pass an L value, something will break somewhere. Okay. Um, but since it is an uh, since it is a forwarding reference, I'm using forward. Um, and the rest is quite the same. The rest is quite the same. Um, do I need a copy constructor? No, because, well, eventually, eventually, if it is an L value, it will not work. I mean, I can try that. I can show you. If I try to do something with an L value, how can we do that? We can create an L value. We can say, we want to create, let's go to the main, we want to create a new one, like um, auto E2 equals uh, sum of which shell value can we use now? E, E and E, for example, okay? It would not compile because I think that we do not implement something. The, 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 we try here to copy a uh, unique PTR. We try to copy a unique PTR and unique PTR doesn't have a copy constructor, so I block there, okay? But uh, uh, if, if it is, can we still make it work? Not this one because we cannot stood move the same thing twice. I mean, this would me it would be ill formed. We can stood move something only once, so we can do a number for the other one. Okay, this should be sixteen, I think. Yeah, this should be fine. This should work. Um, oh, we didn't actually uh, print that. Let's print it. So and better would it be to change it to E2. Okay, I think it will be 16. And we can see that uh, this is the E that was moved in and the eight that I added as eight and yeah. Okay, but, but, but we, we must use our, our, our value in this example. Okay, that was nice. Um, so the, the next one is, do we need derived classes for some and how can I move this one? I mean, it doesn't appear on my screen. It appears on the presenter screen that is over there. And uh, let's see what is written there. Probably exp. Do we need derived classes for some in exp? What do you say? And the answer is no. I mean, I mean, if you take a look at binary expression, um, we can actually create uh, type name for op, which would not be that just a char. Let's say, okay, you will provide me with the actual operation, which should catch two things. Are you, are you print and are you evaluate? And then I will use that. You can, we can decide to take that as two template arguments or one. Why is it better? What's, what's the advantage? So it reduces compiling, uh, uh, sorry, it reduces coupling, maybe compilation also, reduces coupling. So in a way, why should I derive from you? When I derive from some class, if the base class is changed, it changes me. I mean, a derived class is influenced by its base, but in some cases, ba changing the base is for one derived or not for the other. So if we can do something and achieve the same without inheritance, uh, I think there is a very good talk saying that inheritance is the base of all evil. Did you see this uh, talk? CppCon 2014, something like that. Um, who gave that? Sean Parent. Um, and uh, we also want a step towards eliminating the need for polymorphism. So once we eliminate the inheritance, we can then do another step later for 
all templates, okay? So in order to achieve that, we can actually do something quite simple. Let's see the code. Um, so I think that we can realize that instead of binary expression that takes a char, we can take an op and say, okay, give me the operation that you want to achieve. Now, we want to achieve something more, and I will tell you what. Do you see something new here at line 69? I took a few things together, something new, something nicer. Number disappeared. Now, we still have the number class. Why? Because eventually we need to calculate number. Okay, we need to do something with number. But why should you say number? Why cannot we just, you know, deduce that, oh, this looks like a number, let's create a number. So we want to say, oh, if, if an expression is being born and it gets something which looks like a number, let's just create a number. That would be nicer. And the other thing is that uh, we don't want to say binary expression or something because now we don't have sum and exp. Sum and exp are just the operations. They are not the expression. The expression is binary expression of sum. And we don't want to say that in the main. We want to say just, you know, sum. So I just used using sum as binary ex expression of sum. Okay, so this is some kind of uh, alias factory if you want, but it is not a factory. It's, it's saying, okay, when I say sum, I actually mean binary expression of sum. So now we have a sum in expo because X is, is used by the language. Um, and, and let's see what we do for that. Uh, the idea for the operation is quite simple. We have X, I use two static functions. You can think about other ways to do that. The idea is that I just got rid of, of the inheritance, but um, what about the number? I mean, binary expression is being born here. Let's take sum. Sum is born with, what are the arguments provided for sum? Two expressions in a way, but, but no. In fact, the first one is an expression. The first one is actually a binary expression. Expo is a binary expression. And minus one is int. So then the question is, do we have a proper function that takes int or double? Or some, no, we may need to create that. So we can think about, oh, we have templates. So we can say that, we already said that. Both arguments are templated, okay? But then if you remember, what do we do with a template argument? We try to make unique according to the type of the argument. So it will be a make unique of expression for the first one and a make unique of a int for the second one, which is not good. I mean, we want for the second one to create an actual number. So we want to deduce, oh, this is an int, let's create a number. How can you do that? So maybe just create a few constructors. Since we have, you know, the number of combinations only four, we can do that. This is what I did. I mean, it's quite easy. So the thing here is that we have like four constructors. Let's take a look at them. The first one is, takes two expressions, both are templated. But then I want, I want to narrow them. I want to restrict them. I'm using here con constraint concepts. So I'm using derived from, which comes from, derived from comes from the language. It's a concept added in C plus 20. And derived from can be used here on the template argument saying that I want to say something about expression. It must be derived from expression. Otherwise, if it is not, then you should not consider this function in the overload resolution. And the, the reason that I do that is because if I would not, then the template would be too greedy. And if it would be too greedy, I can show you, but it will catch the thing with the int, which I don't want to. So the first one says, okay, I'm handling the two expressions case. The second one says, I'm handling a double and an expression. By the way, the reason that without this restriction, it will be too greedy and take the int is because int is not a double. Int should be converted to double. Now I, I can say something about, oh, I expect anything that is um, a number with constraints. I took the other approach. I said, okay, I'm converting any number to a double. Why? 
because if you get something which is not an expression, then you will try, you will try to convert it to a double because this is the option that you have. So I have here four uh, constructors, by the way, the last one is not templated. This one doesn't have any template argument. Why? No need to, two doubles. These two have something and this one also. And the reason that I constrained that before C20, it would be quite ugly with a full Sphina uh, thing. I just want to make sure that, okay, you go there only if you got an expression. So actually I have now the way to create an expression with numbers without saying that they are numbers. And that's nice, I like that. Um, unique PTR or short PTR? What do you say? Uh, so let's, let's think about that one. We create E, then we want to create another E, like that one. Can we do it with a unique PTR? Just tried. Can we do it with the unique PTL? The answer is yes, but we need to implement something. So whether unique PTL or shell PTL is another question. The question is, what do you want to do when you get an L value? Do you want to support an L value? Yes, okay. When you get an L value, do you want to copy or do you want to share? This is a design question. This, this is a requirement question. I mean, when I get E, if I change E after creating E2, do you want E2 to be influenced by any change that happens on E? By the way, they are immutable. I don't have any way to change them, but suppose that I would have a way to change. I mean, when you are created, I don't have any set function. They are created by the constructor, but let's assume that I can change them. I can think of a way to change them. Uh, so then the question is, after you created E2 with E, is E2 viewing E or copying E? Well, that, that, that's a requirement question. If I would say, oh, copying E, then shell PTR or unique PTR? Unique PTR. And we can implement that. We'll do it. If you are saying, no, I, I just want to view E, which, which is a bit risky, because when you view E, it means that you have to take care of lifetime avoiding any dangling reference issues. You know that views are um, efficient. We have advantages of using views, but we need to take care of lifetime. So um, we can do both. Uh, let's start with thinking about uh, unique PTL. So uh, for that, we need to implement clone, which means, oh, I got you as an L value. So I need a copy, but, but inside the old unique PTR of the internal expressions that you hold, right? So I, I need to, in a way, copy the internal unique PTRs that you hold inside. How can I do that? By asking for a clone, cloning the internals that you have. Okay, we can do that, let's do it. So it will, it will look something like that. Expression will, all, will be almost the same. I just added this one. Okay, now I, I don't implement that here with CLTP. We can think about, oh, maybe you can implement that in the base with a previously recurring template pattern if you know there is a way to implement a clone in such a way, but I just um, declared clone as a pure virtual function. And then number, let's start with number. Our number is cloning itself. So I decided that clone will always return a unique PTR of expression, by the way, can I return here a unique PTR of number? Because I actually return a unique PTR of number. Can I do that? So the, the answer is with, with pointers, a virtual function in the derived can have a different signature. And the only difference that is allowed is to return a return value, which is derived of the return value of the base, which is called covariant return type. But it doesn't work with uh, unique or, or uh, shared PTR. There isn't covariant return type because with unique and shared PTR, the way that it works is that it, unique PTR of number does not derive from a unique PTR of expression. So the compiler will just block that. So uh, that's fine. I'm saying that I will return a unique PTR of expression even though I know that I'm returning a unique PTR of number. I cannot actually uh, utilize here the idea of covariant return type. The way, don't get too upset about that. Uh, this is clone. 
Okay, how do we clone? Uh, all the rest is quite similar. How do we clone uh, binary expression? So we clone both sides, right? We clone the first, we clone the second, and, and, and that's it. I mean, in order to clone, oh, um, wait. Uh, we implement a copy constructor. Do you see that we implement a copy constructor? This is the copy constructor. And then the clone is just to make a unique of myself with myself, which is calling the copy constructor. Which means, can you copy my internals? Yeah, I can. Okay, do that. This is clone. Uh, and then we can actually have a, the, the thing. We can actually do this, and it will work. Which means, this is something important. Being a unique PTR doesn't mean that you cannot copy. It means that you need to implement something in order to copy. And, and, and unique PTR means that I have a sole owner. That's okay. I still may be able to copy. So this is what we did here. We have some questions in the chat. Let's see, chat. The audio is muted. Okay, that's old. Uh, that's, that's old, okay. Do you hear us? Give us a, a, something in the chat saying, yes, we hear you. Oh, there you got just uh, uh, off. Okay, we'll not wait for them. Uh, so this was the idea with a unique PTR. Yes, we can do that. Um, then the question is, so what about shared PTR? Oh, the moving will, will work. I mean, if it is an R value, if it is an R value, I'll just move. Sure, sure. Uh, how, can I, how, can I actually, how can I actually differentiate between the two? I guess that the way to differentiate is that in the constructor, let's see, it's, it's a good question. Oh, I think that it works. Oh, it is important. It works because eventually somewhere I'm folding. And when I'm forwarding, I'm actually calling either the copy constructor or the move constructor, but A, wait, there is something else that was added. When I make a unique now, I added remove CVRF. And the reason is that the type that I get from the template argument is not something that I can use for make unique if it is an L value. Why? If it is an L value, then the double ref is captured by the double ref, and the template argument is just the type without any ref, which worked before. But once I have an L value, then the L value is captured with its own reference by the template argument, and the double ref is just collapsed due to reference collapsing. So the type that is captured by the template argument, by the template parameter is is an L value with a reference. And then you cannot use make unique because you cannot create a smart pointer to a ref. There isn't any, a pointer to a ref is invalid. So you need to remove the reference, which I didn't have to do before because I hadn't that problem because I just used the R value case. Now, when I'm using also the L value case, I need to take care of that. And this is why we have here in the make unique, remove CV ref. Because I want to just get the value type, that's it. Yes, John. Yes. It's, it's a question of, do you want to reuse? I mean, here, because we are immutable, then why should you copy? You're immutable. Maybe sharing is, is smart. But if I can change you, maybe I don't want to share. I, I like this idea. I think that we'll try that. Yeah. So, so uh, the, the, the idea that was raised was, why should you actually hold the unique PTR inside or a pointer at all? Why can't you just hold the thing that was passed to you? Now, the, the, the answer is because for polymorphism, you must. If I want to hold the type that I got as a type, which I don't know which kind it would be, okay? And in runtime, it can be any type, then in a way, I cannot hold something without knowing the type, but I can hold the pointer to a base class. So this, our polymorphism leads me to 
smart pointer, a pointer, a reference, whatever. And again, I like the idea. Okay. So uh, uh, the idea that was raised is if the type of the class is based on the actual arguments provided, then you can actually template the entire thing and avoid the need for any pointer as members. Yes, this is something that we will want to achieve. Uh, so if you go back and press slideshow again, then we are with trying to have a shared PTR. Let's try to have a shared PTR. So the idea for shared PTR is quite similar, but with shared PTR, um, there wouldn't be any need for there wouldn't be any need for a clone. Right, because I was share, just sharing. Okay, um, something happened. Uh, it's just loading. Okay, that's. Um, yeah, we can think about stood variant if you want to steal all the types. But then, I, I in a way, yeah, we can do that. In a way, it might be that it um, will make some burden on on. Uh, maintaining the type that holds this variant. Once you like open that for, oh, you can invent any derived class or any operation. I don't have to maintain the generic algorithm or the generic class. And and for, with variant, I would have to. Um, let's try it again. So I press this one uh, for short PTL. Let's have a, another trial. Yes, now it works. So for short PTL. The thing that I need to do is to make it a shared PTL and then use make shared, right? You see how to make shared? Uh, now, then the question is how come it is E1 here without all the remove uh, reference? Oh, I used another trick here. I would say, um, no, the previous one was nicer. I just created another type in the template saying that, oh, and I call E1 the CV, remove CV ref for there just because for not having to do it here. And now it's, it's the same idea. So eventually no need for clone and you can actually hold E, but if I will change E, E2 will be changed with that. Why? Because E actually shares the E2. Okay, yeah, we can understand what actually happens there. The copy is like copying the reference to the same object. Doable, it's a design question. Oh, by the way, here, I think that the shared approach may be better, I think. Why? Because the class is immutable anyhow. But if it is not, then maybe the copy. By the way, a, a, a question regarding the copy. If we are in a, a concurrent environment, multi-threaded environment, then do we have to synchronize with both approaches with only one of them? The answer is we need to, to synchronize with both. Why? Because the copy constructor and the clone that we implemented are not thread safe. When you start to copy something and another thread is using it, it may be change and may change it. Okay. Of course, if you are immutable, then this is something else. But if 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 you are immutable, I think that you may go without um, synchronizing in both. Yes. Oh, the question is, do we declare the shared pointer as const? No. So the thing that makes it actually uh, uh, immutable is the fact that uh, exp uh, expression and its derived classes doesn't have any set function. They only have a constructor. Maybe to add a const here. Makes sense. Let's check if we do that. I think it would compile. I, I don't think that there is any issue with adding the const. So let's just try to do that. Um, so adding const to the shell PTR. Uh, right after the shell PTR, our next step would be templates. We want to template it all. We want to say, why should you actually hold anything which is dynamic when, in a way, in a way, in our example, I mean, we create 
the type in, in a compile time, I know, we know what the expression holds, right? We see it in the code. Um, we'll check it later. I don't know why, uh, again, uh, clearly it becomes a bit um, slow. Okay, so can we implement without polymorphism? And the answer is we can try. So we want to do something like, okay, if you know the expression types, then you can create an object based on these expression types and it will be a different type of object, a different type of class. Yes, we can do that. Uh, it might be that we'll have class inflation, the code may be inflated, but we don't actually care. It, it may affect compilation time, but we are working with incredible, we, we are happy with that. Uh, so binary expression here holds two expressions. Which kind of expression is that? What is expression one, expression two? Anything, there are template parameters, okay? Which means maybe, maybe we, we want to um, narrow them, to restrict them, maybe, but, but how can we restrict them? I mean, do we need any expression base class? No, I'm not sure that we need any, any base class. Maybe we can say that it is derived from binary expression. We can say it should derive from binary expression, but, but maybe it's, I don't know. Anyhow, anyhow, we'll think about that. Um, and, and then eventually we can create something like that. So um, why is it better? No need for virtual functions. We call something like that static polymorphism in a way. I mean, there is some kind of dynamic behavior which is not actually dynamic, which is uh, um, solved at compile time. Is it actually better? Uh, not necessarily, I mean, there are pros and cons, which we'll not have time to discuss now, but all the pros and cons when we compare template static polymorphism versus virtual functions, um, performance versus uh, code inflation, uh, things that can be done at runtime. Maybe we actually need to create things at runtime. Uh, so let's take a look on how can we implement it. So we have binary expression. You can see that expression disappeared. What is the expression? Oh, we don't need you. So we have binary expression with two type names for expression one, expression two. And again, we can think about maybe we want to um, restrict them. By the way, if we do not restrict them, we still restrict them at the end. In the end, they are restricted. By what? But the things, but the things that we do with them, if we call eval, if we try to print them. But then if, if something doesn't work, the compilation error would be much more ugly than if we say the requirement add. And the second thing is that it may also, using the requires or using the, the constraint on the template uh, parameter, uh, it may reduce also compilation time. Um, so we have here the constructor. Now, why do I use the expression with a underscore? Why not expression one, expression two? because I will have name collision with the one that like is, is captured by the class. So eventually I have here a constructor saying, okay, you provide me something of two types, which I don't know. Now, in a way, I don't want the user to be required to say, I need a binary expression, angle brackets of this and that, and then provide the arguments. I want the user just to create some and provide two arguments, which means that I want to use CTAD class template argument deduction. I want the object to be created based on the proper class without saying which class. I mean, when we use a vector of integers, we need to say vector angle brackets int. Do, do you uh, um, uh, know a case where we don't have to say vector angle brackets int and the compiler understands that we actually wanted the vector of integers? If you create a vector of integers like vector without angle brackets int, vector v equals L brackets and student initializer list of integers. And then we get C17 plus template argument deduction, which is nice. I want to achieve something like that. So in order to achieve that in a way I need, I think that I need here to have either, either a deduction or I use there another way, another thing. The, the reason that I used another thing is that you cannot create um, type deduction which is specialized. You, once you have a type deduction, the deduction must use all the arguments. Now here, 
I want to deduce based on expression one, expression two, but I want to deduce different things for sum and for expo. So in a way, the user, like uh, when I say sum, I want to say, okay, I want to create the binary expression of sum, and I want to deduce E1 and E2. So I cannot actually use your deduction rules. Instead, of, I'm using the um, technique that was used before CIVIL 17. Before CIVIL 17, when you wanted to create an object without saying the type, you just used a factory method. You just said, okay, I will have a, a method. The nice thing with the method is that methods can deduce the types without saying the types. I mean, this is C plus 98. This is the idea of function templates. So the, temp the function can deduce expression one, expression two. And since you asked for some, I'm saying, oh, I know that you want some. And regarding the others, I will just use the types that I did use. And then eventually I have here the thing, that thing. And, and E1, E1 is actually a sum of exponent and number. A sum of exponent of number and number and number. I mean, this is a very specific type, E1. And if you create something else, it will be a very specific other type. You can actually create it as a constant expression because all the constructors that I created and the functions are constant expression, which means that you can actually do a static assert that the evaluation of this thing should be three and a half. And the evaluation of this thing should be eight. And this can be checked now at compile time. That's nice. Why? Because it is all done at compile time or it can be done at compile time. Okay, we're almost done. Not yet. I don't know. Did you did you count six? Or I, do I still owe you one? Or do we have six by now? So um, adding back class number, I will not go through that. But in the previous example, I didn't have class number. It worked without class number. Okay. The the thing is that without class number, I actually held something to old number without class number. Uh, but then when I printed it, when I printed it, um, it didn't print the uh, break the parents on a negative number, which was a bit upsetting. So I added number back, which is doable, nothing too fancy, um, either with deduction guides for a number or with a, a converter um, to expression, something that I added for number. This is not so important. But then the question is, what else can we add? Give me an example of something that will say, oh, it will be nice to have also Hmm? Uh, another operation. Um, I, I would stay with these two operations, but for some, I mean, for X, I, I think that X is, is good. For some, I can improve some in a way. I can do something for some. Make it something which is not uh, necessarily binary. Some can be variadic. Okay, so let's make it variadic. So the next thing is to say, you know what? We can make it variadic. We can actually say that some can take any number of arguments of types, which types? I don't know, expressions or numbers, which I don't have to say that there are numbers. Okay, so I want something like, uh, you can calculate the sum of uh, four and a half and expo of something and minus one. Here I have three arguments, but it can be two or three or four or seven or whatever. Sum here is two. Expo, expo will always be two. Why? Because I cannot calculate um, to the power of with more than two. Um, I mean, exactly two in it. So let's take a look. Do you have in mind how to do that? It's quite easy. I mean, variety templates. Okay, let's, let's see. Uh, dot, dot, dot. Okay. Uh, and here it comes. So we have expression. Okay, so we start with expression. Expression, I mean, not only some, specifically some, but maybe other expression. Expression needs to hold expressions. How many? I don't know, as many as you give me. So we will hold them with a tuple or a tuple if you want. Uh, so we have expression with a tuple of inner expressions. Then in the constructor, we just forward the things into the tuple. Then apply was added in C17. That's nice, apply. When we say, okay, I want to print. So I say, okay, I have the tuple. Can you please apply this lambda 
on the tuple. Otherwise, it would be quite hard to implement that. I mean, it would be to implement apply. Uh, and then we actually print the entire thing with, uh, of course, relying on a proper print function for the operation that you want to print. And then the same thing is for the eval. I'm saying, you know what? Um, take the tuple and send it as uh, arguments for the op eval, okay, from the inner expression. In a way, it's like um, unfolding the variadic expression, expression or folding, uh, uh, no, unfolding it, like opening it uh, into the function. Um, and, and last thing is that, that we also have um, operator double for some reason, I don't remember why, uh, casting operator. Okay, so if you are sum, if you are sum, I need to implement two functions, print and eval. And I can use it for constant expression. So I'm saying, uh, first print the first argument. Then if the size of the rest is bigger than zero, in a way I also um, accommodate sum of a single argument. But if you have more, then please print the plus and then print the rest by calling print again in a recursive way. And in a recursive way, only with the tail. So eventually we'll get, oh, and now I'm the last. Okay, so you're the last. The same thing is with the val. If the size, is, the, the size of the tail is zero, so to evaluate you, I just need to evaluate the, the first, which I got by itself. Otherwise, I just need to add E1 to the evaluation of all the rest. Nice, right? Easy. Um, somebody can ask, what about forwarding? There is a question here about forwarding. It's, it's quite complicated because you cannot actually forward here because otherwise it might be that you forward more than once. We have to think about that. I mean, this is another question, uh, but maybe we can. I think that there is an issue. Um, then for expression, I, I only accommodate two. I allow only two. And then I also have the factory functions, some can be built from any number, expo only from two. And in the main, I can create any number of arguments for some that I want and get these nice expressions, including, as you can see, using previous expressions like this one. And that is almost the last one. I think that we, we counted six, which brings us to the summary. And the summary is C++ is a multi-paradigm programming language. We are done. Any questions before we conclude? Yeah. Yes, we have some questions. Hello. So you get rid of the number in, um, in the second or the third one. How about the opposite? So if you keep the number or something and uh, get rid of this sum x, all these names uh, would go away. You just use a regular plus and uh, all these uh, things. It should be also doable and would look nicer. So, so um, the question is recorded because you use the mic. Uh, um, I would just summarize it for me. Can we just get rid of sum and x and, and use operators? Yes, yes. I think the answer is, is yes, uh, at least for, for plus. But then let, let me think what we have. Let's, let's assume that we have seven plus three. So it is just using. No, no. I mean, you, you, you keep number. I mean, you, you still need to construct non, the numbers. Uh, or maybe construct exp, because maybe there, are some, maybe there are some functions that do need to be constructed as actual functions. So I think it is doable. I think that we, if we like create operator for binary expression, so assume that you got plus for binary expression. Instead of implementing sum, we can implement operator plus for two binary expressions that will in a way behave like the sum that we just implemented. Sounds like something that we can do. Yeah. Uh, so for, uh, if you would like to avoid printing uh, redundant parentheses. So for all implementations, but the last one, 
it's easy to, to check whether the enclosing type of the expressions was like uh, was negative or higher priority so you don't need to put in parentheses how about uh, how would that be done in the last example with the i think that the last one does have something that oh it doesn't yeah so i, I have to add the number i mean if you want the reason that it just prints the minus one without any parents is that I don't have a number, uh, a class here. No, I, I was talking that. So right? in, and, this and case, the, uh, in the first example, you have the one plus two power two, and it's part of a sum. So these surrounding parentheses are redundant. No, they are, they are not, because there is here uh, uh, order. The order is the uh, uh, one plus two is order is is coming before calling the. Uh, I, I was talking about the, not not around one plus two, but around the power operator. Um, then, we actually don't know what is the order of these operators. It might be that we'll get something which is of a higher order or lower order. So these parents are needed, and we no. I, I add them anywhere for saying. This operation is like atomic in, in a way of you just have to calculate that and then give my give the result. Uh, maybe I'm missing the other question. So you're printing plus as a <clears throat> uh, as an associative operation. So you don't know which plus is the first one. But as the power operation is of a higher priority, you do not need to put parentheses around it anyway. I agree as long as if I would know, the current code doesn't know, if I would know when printing which operation as I order, I could use that maybe, maybe. But um, in a way I'm saying, okay, each operation is being calculated on its own, no. ignoring any order, right. okay? So, I, I, I mean, I will, good questions, and, and I, I thank you for the questions, and it makes, you know, I, I'm, thinking about things that I can add more, and then it will be not six uh, ways, but maybe eight or nine. Uh, but I will publish the slides, and you will have the links, and you can play with it, and, and share with me later on anything. So, uh, but, but please still ask questions. I like that. Are there any other questions? Questions, suggestions, uh, uh, let's try to play with some piece of code. So, uh, in the interest of our friends at JC Frog. I think we're going to take our questions at the bar. I believe yeah, yeah, you yeah. join us. Yeah, we can do that. Okay, so thank uh, everyone. Uh, give a shout yeah, out. Well, thank I think you, we still, uh, okay. We